Okay, welcome everybody. Um, before we begin, I would like to take care of uh, the few housekeeping issues. The first regarding the, um, the interpretation, um, please note that the, this session has an interpretation um, which will be provided in five languages, Arabic, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. So um, as you know that in the bottom of the webinar, um, the, the page that the, you will see the interpretation circle and you could click that and, and uh, select the language that you would like to hear. Second is regarding the recording. The session will be recorded and it will be shared on the Health Week website. So those are the, the two housekeeping issues we would like to um, just announce. And now to begin the session, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Chizuru Nishida. I'm the unit head of the Safe, Healthy, and Sustainable Diet Unit in the WHO Department of Nutrition and Food Safety. And I am responsible for the holding of this session from the WHO side, together with Mr. Joe Joel, the responsible colleagues from the UNICEF side who will be uh, speaking at the end of the session to do the closing. This is the third session out of the total of the eight sessions which, is being, which are being um, the organized as part of the Health Talk series, which UNICEF and WHO are organizing this week as part of the preparations for the Nutrition for Growth Summit to be hosted by the government of Japan on the 7th and 8th of December this year. These sessions this week highlight key priorities and actions that countries are taking or are planning to take to improve food environment and promote safe and healthy diet to ensure health and nutritional well-being for all. In this session, now we will focus on reformulation. As part of a comprehensive policy response to promote healthy diet, WHO recommends countries to adopt and implement a range of policy actions to improve food environment, including physical policies, marketing policies, nutrition labeling policies, or school food and nutrition policies, all of which will be discussed um, in the sessions this week as part of this health talk series. And one of these policy range of policy actions is reformulation of food products to reduce the levels of nutrients associated with obesity and NCD risks, such as sodium or salt or sugars or saturated and trans fats. Many countries around the world have implemented mandatory or voluntary policies to encourage food companies, and manufacturers to reformulate products to contain less sodium and salt and sugars, saturated fat and trans fat, but with different levels of success. So the objectives of this session on reformulations are one to showcase great work and initiatives being carried out by countries in the areas of sugars and sodium reduction and trans fat elimination, and two, to learn from their experiences on how they develop their policy and what were some of those factors which had supported the advancement of policy development and also implementation. And any results or outcomes of actions which they may have seen or um, have observed so far and also any challenges faced by them in implementing these policies or developing and implementing these policies and how they address those challenges. This is with a view to stimulate and drive ambitious country commitments. And also we hope the commitments of food companies for implementing impactful actions at the Nutrition for Growth Summit in December, such as accelerating reformulation of food products. Before further ado, I would like to introduce and hand over the floor to Ms. Helena Laurent, Director General of Consumer International, who has kindly agreed to moderate this session. 
Helena, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chizuru, and welcome to everybody joining the call today. Thank you very much for joining. Um, and this is a fantastic set of sprints that we're participating in, um, uh, set up by uh, the WHO and UNICEF in this case. Uh, my name is Helena, as you heard. I'm the Director General of Consumers International, and that's a network of 200 consumer advocacy groups in 100 countries around the world. Um, I'll pop into the chat. We um, participated in the UN Food Systems Summit recently, and product reformulation was one of the key uh, topics we highlighted, uh, making sure that uh, there is action on sugar, salt, and trans fats. Um, incentivizing product reformulation and making sure that there are standards that also shape public procurement. So it's a fantastic opportunity and pleasure um, to be able to moderate the session here today. And I look forward to learning a lot. Um, the way in which uh, the session has been shaped is a great one. We're going to hear from experts first to ground us in um, facts. We're then going to hear from some awesome examples of country action around the world all different experiences because this uh, really impacts everybody. And we have to think about what are the best practices we can learn from? How can we move forward faster together? And then we have an opportunity for questions and answers. Um, I have been told that you can put those into the Q&A, which is on Zoom at the bottom of your screen, pop them in there and we'll be watching out for those and answer as many as we possibly can. That does mean, and I warn uh, all of the speakers here today, that um, I will be a little bit ruthless on timing with you and give you a warning um, to make sure we stay on time. So with that, let's uh, listen to our experts. And I am thrilled that we have Martin Nort, who is from Wageningen, uh, the leading uh, university, of course, on the topic of uh, food and the future of food. And then Rain Yamamoto, who's from the WHO, who can share with us uh, between them the expert view on product reformulation and then the way in which the WHO uh, perceives this and actions in place. So what I would love um, is, could I see if Martin, Dr. Nort, are you with us? Aha, I can see you. Um, over to you. Please share um, the importance of this particular topic, um, the way in which uh, you see progress, um, and I believe I'm going to ask you if you could take roughly five minutes or so. So I'll come in and wave my hand or shout later on. Over to you, over to you Martin. Thank you so much. Um, so I would like to, um, um, uh, to tell about the opportunities and the challenges that there are for food reformulation from um, uh, the perspective of the food industry. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so food reformulation can be defined as the process of improving the nutritional composition of processed foods. So first of all, we can think of to reduce the negative uh, nutrients, so negative in, in the way that they are being overconsumed by consumers in the total diet. And that is specifically uh, the case for sodium, for fat and for sugars. And for fat, that can be further specified into the total amount of fat, but also uh, specifically the amount of saturated fats and the amount of trans fatty acids. Um, uh, for fat and sugar, um, uh, it, it is also about reducing the total energy content of the processed foods uh, in, in, in view of, for instance, obesity. Um, we can also think of increasing the amount of positive nutrients like dietary fibers, but we have to be aware that still also in food with for instance, uh, more nutrients like dietary fibers, still the reduction of sodium, fat, and sugars also in these products is very important. And when we have to prioritize um, the, the nutrients that need to be uh, reformulated for, overall, for the overall health risks, uh, we have to uh, reduce in particularly the amount of sodium, sugars, and trans fats, which I will shortly um, go through in this presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, so when we look to uh, the sodium, sodium in foods, then first of all, um, we have to uh, acknowledge that the major intake from sodium by the consumer is through processed foods, about taking about 77% of the total sodium intake is coming from processed foods. And the high contribution of this uh, sodium intake comes from 
the main and base food categories like bread, cheese, processed meat, uh, uh, among others. So the uh, reduction of uh, sodium in the overall diet of in these food products is very important. And that's not so easy because of the complex uh, nature of the techn technological functionality of sodium in, in food products, which can be uh, summarized into three um, uh, functionalities. Uh, the, the, the processing and product quality, uh, the influence on shelf life and safety, and on taste perception. And for example, here I describe the functionalities in bread. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the sodium uh, on, on taste perception, it gives, of course, the nice and salty taste that we like, but also um, it is very important for the overall taste enhancement and masking of taste. So sodium reduction is very important for taste. Uh, but also in the process and product quality, uh, the sodium is uh, influencing the, the, the dough properties uh, and also regulating, for instance, fermentation. So that's also for the food manufacturer an important, uh, important issue. And also the shelf life and safety uh, need to be ensured. Um, next slide, please. Um, but what I really want to address, I cannot go into detail, but on all of these critical uh, functionalities of sodium, there are there is knowledge available and there are strategies to overcome all the issues that there are. Okay, go to the next slide, please. So um, to, to summarize um, uh, about sodium reduction in food, there are many possibilities to reduce the sodium content in products while maintaining good quality and sensory pro properties, at least for 20 to 60% uh, reduction in most, uh, most foods. And we also know that consumers do accept food with substantial sodium reduction, um, and that uh, the reduction of sodium content in foods leads also to actual reduction of the sodium intake by consumers. However, sodium reduction is often a competitive disadvantage for the food producer. It involves higher costs. Uh, the replacers are sometimes uh, E numbers. There are taste differences that, that needs to be overcome. And um, what I definitely want also to, to tell is that also the consumers usually do not want um, uh, to pay, for instance, an additional um, uh, cost uh, for, the, for the sodium reduction. So for the, for the food manufacturer, that's, that, that is really an, uh, an issue. We also, I think that's uh, my final message about sodium, is that uh, product categories that have regulation or legislation in place, and for instance, bread in many countries, uh, that uh, this is the case for, that they achieve the most and also the fastest reduction uh, in sodium content. Next slide, please. Then I want to go continue with, uh, with sugar. In sugar, we see that the sugar um, uh, intake is mainly coming from only four quite uh, broad food categories. So the beverages and uses, the confectionery, uh, pastry products, and sweetened dairy uh, products. And when I first look at uh, liquid and semi-solid foods, so that are mainly the beverages and the, uh, the liquid dairy products, there we see that the, primarily, the primary function of sugars is for the sweetness and taste, let's say. So it is a very important step to gradually reduce the amount of added sugars in these, uh, these products. So to allow the consumers to adapt for lower, less sweet taste preference, let's say. Um, One minute for warning. Uh, for some uh, products, the um, uh, yeah, replacement by uh, net zero sweeteners will be um, uh, needed for companies to have an acceptable uh, quality. Okay, go to the next. Uh, uh, for confectionery, it's even and, and pastry uh, products, it's even more complicated. There also the bulk functionality need to be replaced. So uh, further reformulation is needed. But can you go to the next slide? Uh, the, oops, it is it is possible to um, uh, to uh, reformulate the food products to actually reduce sugars in all these uh, uh, categories. Uh, again, for the, for the food industry, it is very important that sugars are among the cheapest ingredients. And again, a reduction of the cost, a re a reduction is adding to the cost. Um, here, we see the opposite of with salt, that consumers are, awareness is relatively high, 
So uh, consumers are often willing to pay a premium price for a zero sugar product. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, trans fatty acids. Uh, trans fatty acids are majorly uh, originating from the fat, fat processing uh, in the oil and fat industry. So liquid uh, vegetable oils um, are not functional as they are liquid. So they are hy uh, hydro hydrogenated uh, to have the functionality to make an, a biscuit, for instance. Um, with partial hydrogenation, the TFA uh, uh, originates in the product. Um, low TFA margins are available. However, there is an apparent trade-off with higher saturated fat at the same time. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, for food produ producers, the availability of fats with a low TFA content is, is, is very important and they should be functional and have a reasonable cost. And this is exactly the, the difficulty that there are alternatives available, uh, but they are uh, usually more expensive and also less uh, functional. Um, so what we have to say is we, have, we should increase the awareness of both the food produ producers to, um, uh, to use these low fat, uh, low trans fat um, uh, uh, alternatives that are available um, uh, and, 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 and to use these. Um, uh, a last important part is that, um, uh, that for in this category also the um, the legislation, for instance, by a partial hydrogenation uh, ban or by strict maximum levels of TFA in all food product, products is really the, the way forward. And Mark, I'm just going to ask you to wrap up in the next 30 seconds, if that's OK. Yes, yes. Awesome. Thank you. So my take, uh, take home message from this presentation is that there are many possibilities for food manufacturers. Uh, to improve the nutritional quality of their products while remaining high quality. Uh, the technological complexities are different for each food category and often reformulation is a competitive disadvantage for the food manufacturer. So there's higher costs um, um, and, and, and often a limited or no consumer drive to, to pay additional for that. So food manufacturers, nutritionists and the government should really work together to really see how to reduce uh, the intake of these salts, sugars, and TFA, because it is possible. Um, so we have to make it happening together. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Martin, for giving us that overview. And um, you've already sparked a bunch of questions. Um, I'm going to encourage everybody to put questions into the Q&A as well, so we can monitor and follow. Coming direct, though, to Rain, Dr. Yamamoto um, is from the Department of Nutrition and Food Safety at the WHO. What are you doing to encourage uh, countries to take this direction? Over to you. Thanks so much, Helena. So I'm going to share with all of you what WHO has been doing in the space of product reformulation. So for sodium reduction, WHO has established the global sodium benchmarks earlier this year. So these benchmarks are a harmonized global goal that sets the maximum limit of sodium that a processed food can contain. And they are established for 64 priority food categories, which are commonly consumed major contributors to sodium intakes. Now, WHO is working on a step-by-step -step manual to help countries adopt the global benchmarks to develop their own national targets. And additionally, WHO office in Europe is developing the food reformulation manual, which includes reformulation guides for high priority food categories and industry best practice examples. And I would like to add, because I'm seeing in the, in the chat and Q&A about the low sodium salt substitutes such as um, uh, KCL, the potassium chloride, um, WHO is currently in the process of developing guidelines for the use of low sodium salt substitutes, and hopefully we'll be able to um, release that um, later this year or maybe earlier um, next year. So moving on to um, sugars reduction, WHO has updated the guideline on sugars intake for adults and children in 2015. Since then, countries have taken various actions to reduce sugars intake, and one such action is the implementation of SSB taxation, taxation of the sugar-sweetened beverages, as consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages has increased among all age groups, in particular among children. So as of September 2021, there are 79 countries which are implementing SSB taxations, which is great, 
But in terms of reformulation, not much has been done so far for sugars. So WHO is now exploring the possibilities to develop benchmarks for sugars, something similar to what we have developed for sodium. So quickly moving on to um, elimination of trans fat. So WHO has been quite active in this area to achieve the global goal to eliminate industrial trans fat by 2023. So there are two alternative best practice policies that WHO recommends um, countries to develop and implement. One policy alternative is to set mandatory 2% limit on industrial trans fat in all foods. And the second alternative is a PHO ban, partially hydrogenated oils ban. So these two policy options are equivalent. And so far, 40 countries have implemented the WHO recommended best practice policy. So for supporting countries, WHO has released technical guide called Replace Action Package, which includes six modules. So that's it for me. Um, I'll hand back over to you, Helena. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Martin and Rain, for giving us that um, opening overview. What we're going to do next is, one, talk about uh, sugars, sodium, trans fat, uh, bit by bit. And we're also going to hear from a range of countries and regions about their approaches. Um, I think that will give us a, a fantastic uh, understanding of how leaders have stepped forward and made change happen in their own uh, country. Now, uh, we heard Rain mention that very few countries have taken action on sugars in the way that um, we hope and the way that we would like to see, but the UK has. Um, the UK, United Kingdom has taken a specific approach. It's um, within its focus on sugars, it's even looked at um, a taxation approach uh, for beverages. And I'd love to invite uh, Victoria Target uh, to the floor. Hello, Victoria, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And I think uh, Victoria is uh, the team leader from the, for, the diet, for dietary improvement um, at the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities. Um, and Victoria, the floor is yours to share sort of your approach, what you've done and what you've learned. Over to you. Thank you, uh, Helena, and um, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the seminar. Um, so um, as well as talking about sugar reduction, which I will get to in a moment, um, I thought it was first important just to set the scene within the UK. We have been working to try and reduce levels of obesity through a number of actions since around 26, well, since before that, but in a very concrete way since 2016. Um, that is when our soft drinks industry levy and the sugar reduction program were both um, launched. Um, but we also have another uh, an, a number of other um, initiatives which are currently in progress, um, a calorie reduction program, but also limitations around advertising and uh, volume or price um, and location promotions and some other measures which are coming in. It's also interesting to note that as of last summer, uh, the focus shifted slightly away from children, um, uh, which was gave a very clear permission for action, more towards looking at adults um, in relation to the poorer outcomes um, um, related to COVID-19 for those who are overweight or obese. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So one of the first initiatives in our sugar reduction program was our soft drinks industry levy. Um, a number of other countries have these measures, um, but um, it was announced in 2016, came into law two years later. It applies to manufacturers and importers of added sugar soft drinks. Um, and there are two rates um, for the levy. Uh, there is the lower levy rate, which applies from five to eight grams per 100 mils, and then another rate which applies from eight grams upwards. Um, if you have products that are below five grams, then you do not need to pay the tax or levy. Um, part of the purpose in setting the levy rates in the way that they were set, and also um, in the two year gap between the levy being announced and coming into law was to give businesses the opportunity to reformulate their products um, and to um, uh, avoid paying the tax. Uh, we know that a number of businesses have done that. 
Um, I'll come on to the uh, changes we've seen to date, but certainly by the time the law came in in 2018, at least some businesses were not going to pay any tax through the levy at all. Also, just to say that juices and milk based drinks are currently exempt from the levy, but are included in our wider sugar reduction programme, and we published guidelines and ambitions for those products in May 2018. Could I have the next slide, please? So the sugar reduction programme um, is challenging all parts of industry to reduce sugar in foods that contribute most to intakes of children up to 18 years by 20% by the end of 2020, so the end of last year. The food categories included in the programme are those that you would expect and other ones that Martin referenced in his presentation. So are those, as I say, that contribute most um, and, and uh, are quite a small portfolio of products. Um, we do include children up to the age of 18 um, so that all products within a category form part of the reformulation programme, not just those products that are marketed for or produced for children. We give businesses three methods to reduce sugar in their products. Um, so to reformulate products to lower sugar levels in products, that is our preferred method that is likely to have the most impact on intakes, as is also reformulating the biggest selling standard products within a business's portfolio. Um, alternative measures, though, are to reduce portion size of single serve products or to shift consumer purchasing towards lower or no added sugar, sugar products within the categories. Um, next slide, please. So we can see so far the progress that um, has been made to date. Um, uh, we monitor and publish progress reports for the sugar reduction program annually. Um, and we feel that's a really important part of the program um, that we are transparent in the progress that is made. We don't just look at progress across um, the categories. We also look at progress by individual businesses that are the big players within each category, um, but also within the individual brands. I'm not presenting any of that data today um, purely for time purposes. Um, so we can see overall that between 2015 and 2019, we saw a 3% reduction in the levels of um, uh, in the sugar levels coming from the products included in the program. Um, a, a, absolutely, that's not the 20% that we had hoped for. Um, but I think it's notable that uh, there have been some substantial reductions in some categories. So breakfast cereals and yogurts, where perhaps reformulation is easier. Um, you can also see, though, that there are some middling levels of reduction of around five and six percent in some other categories. There is also very little action in, for example, the confectionery um, sector. Uh, there's more mixed progress in the out of home sector um, and uh, overall and across the individual categories. Um, I think it's important to note, though, that um, there have been over the lifetime of the program, there have been some increases in sales of some of the higher sugar products. And because we monitor using both sales and nutrition information, that is partly what reduces the overall impact of the program uh, down to three percent. We can also see on this slide, though, that our soft drinks industry levy has better has had a very substantial impact on uh, the levels of sugar coming from the products that are covered by the levy. Through retailer and manufacturer products, we've seen a reduction of nearly 44 percent um, and uh, a reduction of close to 39 percent in products that are available in the out of home sector. Um, um, that is, as I've said, I think partly due to the structure of the levy, the fact that there were two years to comply ahead of um, the levy rates being applied, but also the fact that reducing levels of sugar in drinks is much simpler than um, in many of the other food products that have formed part of the programme. Could I have the next slide, please? Just a 30 second final warning. Thank you. Thank you. So the purpose of this slide is just to highlight that the levels of reduction that we have seen apply across all socioeconomic groups and all socioeconomic groups are benefiting from the reductions that we have seen. Um, can I skip the next slide, please, and then go to the next? Thank you. Uh, the purpose of this slide is just to illustrate that levels of sugar in the juices and milk based drinks have also come down. 
one of the reasons that that has happened, we think, is because there has been a very clear threat to take milk-based drinks into the levy if not enough progress was seen. Um, and we can see that, for example, there have been reductions in of around 22% in pre-packed milk-based drinks. And we absolutely think, as I've said, that, that the reason such large reductions have been achieved in just one year of that programme are because of this threat of a tax or levy. My last slide, um, it was just to highlight that we are setting up a calorie and sugar reduction network jointly with the WHO EU. Um, the first meeting of that is due to take place next year and everyone is, is uh, within the WHO European region is, is welcome to join and, and attend, mem uh, attend meetings. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria. That was a fantastic overview. And sorry to rush that. Because no, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. There was fantastic data in there. And I think we can see a number of questions coming through already. Um, I'll just say to all of the panelists, um, do feel free to answer questions as we go through um, uh, so that we can get most out of the, the session together. And with that, moving from the UK, we're going to now go to Argentina. Um, do I have Dr. Uh, Abrata? on the line. So Maria Graciela Abraza is um, the director of the National NCD program at the Ministry of Health of Argentina. And that is Argentina is one of the few countries with a mandatory national sodium target. Um, can we see if uh, we have hello? Let me just check. We may be having. Hola, sí, buenos días. Hello, buenos días. Buenos días. Disculpen, no sé qué está pasando con mi cámara, que no la estoy pudiendo activar. No sé ah, si es un problema okay. de mi computadora o que no me tienen que habilitar ustedes. No me anda la cámara. Bueno, no, empezamos no. entonces con la presentación. Muy buenos días Pero o prefiero. buenas tardes o buenas noches a todos, a todas. Eh, lamento no tener mi, mi cámara disponible. Eh, antes de comenzar, quiero agradecer a las autoridades de la Organización Mundial de la Salud y de UNICEF por, por invitarnos, por darnos esta oportunidad de, de participar en, en este evento tan importante y además de permitirnos compartir con ustedes, a ver si ahí podemos, no, permitirnos compartir, eh, como les decía, con ustedes, ahí estamos, muchas gracias. Eh, nuestra experiencia en la implementación de la Política Nacional de Reducción del Consumo de Sodio en, en nuestro país, en la Argentina. La próxima, por favor. Entonces, el principal objetivo de esta política justamente es favorecer la reducción del consumo de sodio en nuestra población, dando cumplimiento a la Ley 26.905, la próxima. Esta ley y su reglamentación establece, la próxima por favor, establece los límites máximos de sodio en eh, alimentos y a su vez contempla una serie de estrategias que de alguna manera van a traccionar para reducir, reducir el consumo de, de sodio en nuestra población. La próxima por favor, no sé qué pasa, muy bien. Eh, como les decía entonces, esta, esta ley establece los límites de máximo de sodio en los alimentos y a su vez contempla una serie de estrategias como por ejemplo eh, la, la incorporación de mensajes de advertencia en los paquetes de, de sal que se comercializa una serie de, de, de estrategias también en los restaurantes a fin de eh, favorecer, como decíamos, la disminución del consumo de sodio en nuestros alimentos, entre ellos lo que se contempla es la oferta de menús bajos en sodio, que tengan mensajes de advertencias sanitarias también en los restaurantes, quitar los aleros de las mesas, que ofrezcan incluso opciones de sales dietéticas y también disminuir el tamaño de los paquetes individuales de sal. Nosotros hemos pasado de paquetes de 2 gramos a 0.5 eh, gramos. A su vez también contempla la incorporación de campañas de sensibilización. La próxima. Con lo cual antes y después de la 
eh, sanción y la, re, y la reglamentación de esta ley, podemos diferenciar claramente dos fases, una voluntaria y otra normativa o mandatoria. En la primera fase, esto comenzó en el año 2009, con la, el lanzamiento del plan Menos Sal, Más Vida, este, este plan eh, incorporaba a su vez una serie de estrategias que se comenzó a trabajar a partir de la firma de acuerdos voluntarios con la Asociación de Panaderos. Esto continuó hasta 2000, durante 2010, 11, 12 y parte del año 2013 con la firma de convenios con distintas eh, empresas de la industria alimentaria. Eh, gracias a esto prácticamente se logró disminuir el contenido de sodio en casi 800 productos alimentarios. <coughs> Disculpe. En el 2013 eh, se sanciona la ley nacional 26.905, esta fue la primera ley de promoción de la reducción de consumo de sodio en Latinoamérica y la segunda en el mundo, eh, que fue reglamentada en el año 2017. <coughs> en, en 2018 se realiza la encuesta nacional de nutrición y salud, por la cual, a través de la cual se logra obtener por primera vez mediciones objetivas del promedio de consumo de sal en los habitantes de nuestro país. El resultado fue que en promedio consumimos aproximadamente 7.9 gramos por día, prácticamente 8, casi el doble de lo que está recomendado para los adultos. Eh, a partir de, de este año se, se inician, una, se impulsan una serie de, de mesas de reformulación del contenido de sal en, en básicamente en tres grupos de alimentos, por un lado los cárnicos y sus derivados, por otro lado el, los farináceos, perdón, y también en, eh, sal, en sopas, eh, caldos y salsas. En 2020-2021 se abren tres mesas de reformulación en eh, quesos, en snacks y, y salsas, eh, o aderezos, y, y lo que venimos trabajando fuertemente es la eh, promoción, como decíamos, de la reducción total del contenido de sodios en distintos eh, productos alimenticios industrializados, estamos trabajando también en la incorporación de las advertencias sanitarias en los paquetes del sal, y fuertemente eh, favoreciendo o fortaleciendo la capacidad de fiscalización de los departamentos de seguridad alimentaria, de bromatología a nivel local, es decir, en las eh, provincias. Las la próxima, por favor. Uh, ask you to close just in 30, 30 seconds, if you could, Dr. Abriata. Ok. Eh, en relación a, eh, como decíamos, a la reducción del, del contenido total de sodio en los alimentos industrializados, a partir del artículo 5 y sus, eh, sus incisos B y C, lo que establece es que el Estado debe eh, fijar y controlar las pautas básicas de eh, la reducción de, de sodio de acuerdo a la ley, ¿no? y establece una serie de valores eh, máximos que deben ser incorporados y reducidos en forma, eh, incorporados en el Código Alimentario Argentino y reducidos eh, en forma progresiva en los distintos grupos de alimentos, como les decía. La próxima. La próxima, por favor. Así. Bien, entonces estábamos trabajando, como habíamos dicho, en tres, en tres grupos fuertes. La próxima. En relación a, a los quesos, esta es una, una mesa de trabajo que está actualmente abierta. Tenemos acá una serie de dificultades por el hecho de que los procesos que, se, que requiere la fabricación de, ses, de quesos no es lo mismo en quesos blandos o en los quesos eh, duros, con lo cual se acordó trabajar en los eh, quesos de mayor consumo en el país y en aquellos que ya habían sido incorporados en, en el año 2009-2013, previo a la, a la ley, 
que fueron reduciendo el contenido de, sol de, forma, de sal perdón, en, eh, de forma voluntaria. En relación a las estrategias a SNAP. This is fantastic. Doctor Abriata? Sí. May I ask, um, uh, just in terms of getting uh, through all of the, the speakers that we need to hear from today, um, would you be able to wrap up just in the next 15 seconds? Um, or should sí. we come back to you towards the end? Sí, sí, por favor, puedes pasarme más rápido entonces las, las diapositivas. Vamos a ver. I really lo will que need just a 10 second uh, finishing comment from you and then we can come back. Thank you. Ok. Es difícil cuando no podemos establecer un, un coordinar el paso de las diapositivas con lo que estoy diciendo. Por eso insisto, si podrían pasar las diapos, este, sería más fácil. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we come back um, to the other pieces? This was fantastic and I think um, okay. it's really uh, wonderful to see the way in which Argentina has been driving this change and one of the very few countries to be setting the targets and the care that you've taken to engage um, the, uh, the different stakeholders uh, through the workshops that, that you shared. What I suggest, let's come back to you. What I'd love to do at this point is come to uh, Dr. Eduardo Nilsson, uh, who is in Brazil. So we're going to stay in Latin America. Dr. Nilsson is the deputy coordinator of the food and nutrition division at the Ministry of Health in Brazil. Dr. Nilsson, do I have you there? And wonderful, I can see you there. Um, now, are you going to speak in English or in a different language or, or in uh, Portuguese? No, in English. Okay, perfect. And for everybody, um, remember you have translation at the bottom. Dr. Nilsson, you'll have seen, I am so sorry, I have to be ruthless. Um, so I will give you a one minute warning. You have five minutes. The floor is yours on sodium and I think also trans fats. Over to you. Oh, okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, first of all, it's very important to know the, the burden of disease and the burden of this dietary risk factor. So excessive sodium intake uh, is attributable to 47,000 deaths a year in Brazil and that, and also uh, a huge economic burden that which reaches uh, over $1 billion a year in terms of direct and indirect costs and uh, both deaths and DALI. So it's very important to build this advocacy case. Next, please. And it's very important also, uh, next slide. Oh, thank you. To know the dietary uh, sources of sodium and in Brazil, as in many countries uh, in Latin America and some uh, also in the East, there is a large participation of table salt and salt-based condiments and sauces. So it's very important to address them as well, but an increasing participation of industrialized processed and ultra processed foods. And it's very important that we uh, consume almost twice uh, the recommendation of WHO. So it is a, a health priority uh, in the country and uh, very few adults actually consume less than the recommendation. So it's, it is important to educate people, but also to create uh, a healthy environment. Next, please. So uh, as I said, we are increasing the participation of processed and ultra processed foods uh, in calories, but also in sodium and sugars. And uh, besides that, there has been a reduction in the consumption of uh, actual meals. And so the, the consumption of table salt and salt-based condiments have been reduced over time. So it's very important for us to have this multi-component uh, approach to sodium reduction and other uh, risk factors. Next, please. So um, we, so I said we have a very uh, multi-component policy approach. So first, of course, reformulation uh, to reduce uh, sodium and, and priority foods to voluntary limits in food categories. But also uh, linked to that, we have the the food procurement policies, uh, working on foods consumed out of the out of home, nutritional labeling, especially. Uh, Frontal pack labeling is the last regulations that we have approved, and of course we have to use the diet food based dietary guidelines to uh, for behavioral change, change communication, mass media campaigns, but with the main message to consume uh, uh, fresh foods and to avoid ultra processed foods. Next, please. And. Uh, 
Thank you. So as I said, we have voluntary agreements with umbrella associations of food industries, and we have set maximum sodium levels based on milligrams for 100 grams. We have selected priority food categories based on the participation of salt, sodium uh, in the diet of Brazil, and uh, we intend to have a gradual uh, decrease in uh, sodium contents of foods through biannual targets. So we adapted the UK model to Brazil based on what we have in the country, but using the what we thought would be best, best practices at that moment. And because it's voluntary, it's very important to have very clear criteria and transparent monitoring. But looking towards the future, it's very important to incorporate new categories along the way because we're monitoring the food surveys uh, to use the new international benchmarks, especially uh, Pan American Health Association and WHO have uh, released new benchmarks. So it's very important for us to know how to move to the future. And also, as uh, our friends from Argentina, we look forward to switching from a voluntary to a mandatory uh, targets at some point in time. Next, please. So now it's just a little more detail on. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, on the criteria, I said about the transparent criteria. So we have uh, an official baseline based on, uh, no, previous slide, please. Uh, I, I was just speaking about uh, the, the criteria. It's very important for us to have uh, the baseline, thank you. The upper limits based on what we have. So we have gradual, sustainable, realistic, and transparent reductions. And we have these uh, official reports that are publicly available. And we have set uh, a criteria, important criteria is to have, to have real impact on salt. We aim on the uh, four to six years uh, in the future to have uh, the upper limits will be equivalent to the baseline average or the median that we had at baseline. So it means that we will move forward with at least half of the food products in that category. And of course, we will aim on final targets based on international uh, references, benchmarks, and also on what we have in the country in terms of the lowest content of sodium in foods. Next, please. And here are some results of uh, what we have achieved uh, until we have started uh, our targets in uh, 2010. And we have been monitoring it over time on a biannual basis. And on in 2017, we have seen that we have reached uh, significant reduction, percentage reductions in salt con sodium contact in practically all food categories and some of over 20% reduction in the average content of salt. And at the right, we can see a comparison of uh, the compliance to the national uh, targets, but also we compared to the regional W. Uh, BAHU targets, the Pan American Health Association. And so we see there's a lot to move forward. And that's why I said we need, we need to look also to the international benchmarks in order to see what we have achieved, but what we have to move forward in terms of uh, continuing salt reduction. Next, please. And then we started looking uh, at the impacts. So, so we have data from industry showing how much sodium has been uh, withdrawn from the market and it reaches almost 30,000 tons of sodium uh, over uh, the decade. But it's very important for us to know uh, the health impacts of that. So we've been comparing uh, modeling what has happened. So if, if there is a small reduction yet uh, achieved that is a 0.25 grams per day in terms of salt. And we, I said, we have a 9.3 cons uh, gram consumption per day. So it's very small. It's a, we need to move forward. And we know that if we had uh, more stringent targets, even from the one from the uh, PAHO and the international targets, we could achieve uh, almost four times uh, the impact. So that's very important for us to also to move forward and show uh, uh, to industries that we can move forward because there are international benchmarks using that. And it's very important for us that we have already achieved uh, important impacts like reducing uh, cardiovascular disease cases and preventable deaths. But we know that we have <clears throat> more deaths that could be prevented. Therefore, we must continue uh, on salt reduction. Next, please. So uh, I will uh, wrap up on the sodium reduction. Uh, 
addressing a little some of the key steps for success that we have identified. Firstly, it's in the, uh, the need to continuous. You have to have a continuous approach. We won't reach uh, A to B in one step. You have to go through several steps and a gradual approach is very important for adapting food taste and adapting technology for industries and everything together. It's very important to have multiple strategies to address sodium sources because we have many sodium sources and they all work together. Uh, have transparent and impactful criteria and continuous monitoring and transparent monitoring. And that's very important because it's a voluntary approach. So we have to keep momentum and compliance by industries and also use this data for resetting the targets when necessary. And it's very important to have national data so we can have tailor-made strategies. So that we, as I said, we use the UK uh, policy as an example, but we adapted it to Brazil according to our reality and our situation. Next, please. And uh, thinking about what we more to do or what we could do different, I think it's to continue adjusting targets, incorporating new categories, increasing the enforcement and reach of uh, reformulation targets, and possibly that will mean uh, transiting to regulatory limits because uh, because we were working on a voluntary basis with uh, an umbrella association with they're part of the, this part of the industries left uh, outside of the targets, create targets for. Uh, restaurants, food services, and fast food. So our foods consumed out of the home, it's very important. And continue using these uh, model impacts because it's very important to build this advocacy case to strengthen uh, even the evidence-based decision-making, especially for fiscal and regulatory policies. So it has been used for front of pack labeling. It's very important for us to think of taxating food and limiting uh, the, the sales and also the marketing of foods that were excessive salt, but also uh, sugars, trans fats, and others. Uh, next, please. So I will be very brief, thinking a little bit about what we have done in terms of trans fat elimination. Next, please. Mm -hmm. And, thank okay, you. thank you. <laughs> so I think one of the most important landmarks was uh, the, the Trans Fats Free America Declaration, which uh, was actually complied by industries in Brazil. So we had these limits of two and 5% for foods and that uh, happened together with mandatory labeling of trans fatty acids in Brazil. So uh, along with health claims, so that actually was the first step in reducing uh, trans fatty acids in Brazil. And then there are the other uh, international landmarks over time. Next, please. And we found out that in 2010, when we monitored that many categories were already uh, complying to those limits. And it was very important, what should we do to move forward? We have a, a large reduction. So uh, next please. What we, our regulatory agency called on visa started a regulatory process based on what we had and gathering all stakeholders and gathering uh, the analysis of many proposals, including uh, many aspects of that are detailed at, at the right. And we uh, studied uh, the regulatory impact and that as a part of that, we modeled the impact of regulatory proposals. And what we found is actually that banning trans fat, um, partially hydrogenated oils from the food chain would actually have a, a five-fold increase in, in uh, prevented deaths from CVD. Uh, so that's what I actually based most of the of the decision that we had in the country that was ended by a, a public consultation. Next, please. Which was uh, to work on two-phase approach and which based on actually the, the golden standard that we have internationally that's first limiting a, uh, trans fatty acids for two two percent, and then moving to a second phase, which is banning uh, PHOs from the market. So we have these two strategies together. Uh, next, please. And it's already uh, being enforced at this moment. So the uh, lessons learned is that a phases approach is very important, considering the best global practices. Uh, it's it's very important that. Uh, improving the effectiveness of food reformulation uh, is uh, achieved through regulatory approaches that has been said in Argentina and said in Martin. And finally, uh, again, we have the importance of having tailor-made strategies based on national data to adapt that and actually to gather advocacy and even engage the private sector and gain all of these impact that we need to have the best practices over time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Nelson. And you've given us a great segue to be able to talk even more about uh, trans fats. We're going to move to India. Uh, Dr. Arbyen Prasad is the chairperson of the scientific panel on oils and fats. Uh, he's also a member of the scientific committee of food and safety and standards with the government of India. 
Now, you've just introduced best practice policies uh, just this past February. So tell us a little bit about that and how you plan to make those stick. Over to you. Thank you. How many minutes I have? Um, eight. I'm going to give you eight. a one minute warning. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, yeah. First of all, thank you for giving this opportunity for India to make this presentation. Basically, we, we have uh, we have implemented a multi-pronged approach for the reduction of trans fat. Next slide, please. So basically, when we look at, look at that, our strategy is the aim. They say A, A stands for amend, address, and awareness. I stands for involve, implement, and integrate. M stands for moderate, modify, and monitor. Basically, we included uh, what you call several multi-sectoral connections for particularly bringing these policy interventions. Next, Next slide, please. See, when we started this journey in 2009, so actually in India, we call this partially hydrogenated vegetable oils vanaspati. I may be using continuous vanaspati. Please uh, understand that vanaspati means partially hydrogenated vegetable oils. See, at that time in 2009, we were producing something like 1 million tons. And it's a really important parcel of people for, for some specialty products, particularly for making margarine, shortening, and also several foods. See, basically, this margarine has a with a particular trans uh, vanaspati has a uh, good oxidative stability. All of us, we know, it has a special property, functional properties like crispness, snap, required solid fat index, and all these things. And also, like that, margarine shortening also they have their own uh, way of uh, what you call the applications. Uh, so that was the reason it was very very tough for us to really initiate this particular program of replacing trans fat in India. So that was the reason in 2009, FSA has motivated some research issues like uh, ICMR National Institute of Nutrition and also CSR Indian Institute of Chemical Technology, which I belong, uh, and industry associations like Indian Vanaspati Producers Association, Solvent Exercise Association, and uh, the, the, the Vanaspati Manufacturer Association of India to join hands and support this mission. Next slide, please. So when, when we, uh, all of us, when we, when we, incidentally, I'm fortunate to be associated with this program from the beginning uh, onwards from 2009 onwards. So initially from 2009 to 2012, different stakeholders in association with FSA, we organized several brainstorming uh, meetings uh, to, to impress upon the industry about the importance of reduction of trans fatty acid, particularly in the vanaspati margarine shortening, which is the major problem because edible oils is not more than two, three, four percent. So particularly the following decisions and actions taken by uh, these groups are really what you call helped. They motivate the acts of the challenge in phased manner. See, particularly, we, we wanted to really modify the partial hydrogen process by manipulating pressure, temperature, catalyst for the reduction of TFA, but it's not the total solution. It's very, very tough to, to really reduce the trans fat and by, the, by these things, but up to some extent. And employing palm seed and type of saturated fatty acid rich oils in the hydrogenation process, this really helped us, though that is the reason FSI has approved uh, palm serine as one of the edible grade oils, and also either physical mix or intensified process using chemical or enzymatic approach of unsaturated rich oil with a fully hydrogenated oil or an oil with a high ceric acid, palmitic acid content. So, or combining different types of oil using intensification. So, this sort of approaches we really educated the industry and we motivated them. So, uh, at the same time, FSI also removed the melting point specification for the partial hydrogenated ones, but the previous reduced to 41. So, and also, we, we have motivated the industry to modify the edible oil refineries with a special emphasis to deacidification deodorization. And particularly in that particular uh, step, you know, there will be a lot of change in the uh, uh, trans fatty acid content might, 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 might come. So, all these initiatives motivated the industry to accept the challenge of reduction of TFA up to 10% to start with. And FSSI has introduced the first regulation in 2013. Next slide, next slide, please. Dr. Prasad, I'm getting a message that the brilliant interpreters who are helping translate all of this uh, may find it difficult to keep up uh, because you're speaking uh, uh, quite quickly. So okay, uh, I, I, I'll speak slowly. Slow down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Sorry for that. Take care. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. See, basically, the FSSA Food Safety and, uh, Authority of, uh, of India he started this uh, 2030, the first policy intervention. So initially, it was restricted to 10% by weight. So particularly, mainly four products, uh, it, was, it, was, it was really what you call included. Interestified vegetable fat, bakery, and industrial margarine, and partially hydrogenated uh, uh, vegetable oils, and bakery shortenings. Then 2015, uh, the regulation is amended, 
and we have reduced from 10% to 5%. So, and also label declaration, it was made mandatory in case of, in, with respect to TFA. And trans-free crime was also allowed if trans fatty acid content is less than 0.2 grams per 100 grams per ml of food in, in 2015. Uh, and in 2019, again, trans free fat claim was also allowed for oils also. If it contains less than one gram, that means less than 1%. Uh, 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 and also at the same time, whoever is following this trans free claim, so they can they can really use this trans fat free logo, which was which was released by FSC. Next slide, please. Then in 2019, so phase and reduction of trans fat limited in individual oils. We have, we have really motivated the people. So now in January 2021, we have reduced uh, to 3% now. So, and by for January 1st, 2022, we are coming, we are reducing up to 2%. That means we are reaching the goal in another three, four, three, in another three, three to four months time. So in 2020, actually, we have, we have really what you call particularly uh, regulation to safeguard the children's health. So particularly, uh, particularly high, high, high fat, salt, sugar, uh, and, and also high trans fat content uh, based products are almost banned in the, in the schools to really sell uh, using this particular uh, regulation. Uh, so from 2016 onwards, and FSSI is also strengthening the laboratories network, particularly infrastructure. There are several uh, FSSI recognized labs are there. All these labs are strengthened by, by providing the infrastructure. And also we are collaborating with like AOAC, USP for method sharing. Next slide, please. So another very big movement was started in, in India uh, called as We Try India Movement. Basically, we're trying to educate the, the, the people, eat safe, eat healthy, and eat sustainably. So th th this sort of really propagation continuously it is providing for population and consumers a, a message that FSSA is giving regularly that we are supposed to really restrict all these uh, uh, salt, sugar, and also trans fatty. Next slide, please. And you have your one minute warning there. Thank you. Only one minute. Oh, so I. So so basically, there is a website uh, which was really attracted by 2.3 million uh, people, uh, and also a lot of TFA free uh, what you call material has been circulated. And the Eat Right India challenges, particularly this particular program, is really giving a lot of publicity. Um, the FSA has dedicated website and providing a lot of information to the consumers. Next slide, please. Next slide. So this multi-sectoral approach, we are also, just can you, can you go back? So we also included several organizations like hotel chefs uh, and also nutrition society like, uh, like professional organizations. And they have given a pledge that by 2022 January, they, they, will, they will see that uh, we will restrict to up to 2%. Next slide, please. Uh, similarly, FSA started network of scientific cooperation for food safety and applied nutrition, and also network of professional food and nutrition, and also robust food testing system. More than 260 accredited labs were really what you call provided a lot of uh, uh, a lot of infrastructure. So all these aspects really given given a very strong boost for the implementation. Next slide. Next slide, please. So very recently, we organized a survey. Uh, in which we had to import 419 cities. 6,245 samples were collected, packed materials, uh, vanaspati, shortening, margarine. Uh, and out of that, uh, 1069 uh, samples are oil, vanaspati, shortenings. Out of this, I'm very happy to say that 5,176 samples of uh, packed products, they contain less than 2%, uh, more than 2%, only 0.4%. That means really, we really gave up. And more than 3%, only 0.15%. So coming to oil, vanaspati, shortening, margarine, only 9.4 samples are more than 2%, 7 points are more than 3%. So that means by January 1st, I think more than 90% is implemented to less than less than 90%. So and also initiate and intensified efforts for these categories who found to have uh, relatively higher levels of trans fat through motivating the industry for the modification of process selection of raw materials, improvement, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. I think I'm through. So finally, we have, uh, uh, through our multi-pronged approach, not only meet relevant SDGs, but also aim to be trans-free by 2023. We are aiming at 2022, but definitely by 2023. See, basically we involved 
the industry associations and research institutes. Uh, and also there are several professional organizations like Nutrition Society, Association of Food Scientists of India like that. No, we, we have really taken care of everybody uh, into one platform. And uh, because such a big country, vast country under that eight course, it's very tough to really percolate into the system. That is the reason uh, the FSSI used all sorts of uh, uh, ways to really work about this. Finally, we really succeeded. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Prasad. And I apologize for, for torturing uh, all of the panelists with timing, but really appreciate being able to hear from everybody. That brings us to um, our last speaker for today, after which we will try and fit in some questions. Uh, Ms. Stephanie Bodenbach is from the European Commission. Uh, she is the team leader on food composition. Um, uh, Ms. Bodenbach, do we have you? Hello. Uh, yes, I can see you there. Wonderful. Can we just test? I think you're on mute, so you may need to unmute. Yes, I hope you can hear me. Wonderful. Yes, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yes, first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to share some of the experience in the EU with reduction of trans fats. Next slide, please. And I would like to start with um, that policies on trans fat reduction in the EU date back since many years. So there have been a lot of initiatives in the past uh, to remove trans fat from the food chain. There were many commitments by industry, industry associations. So there have been many achievements. However, there were always still reports of certain foods being high and trans fat being on the market and certain population groups exceeding recommended uh, limits. So despite these uh, voluntary reductions, uh, finally, there was the decision taking to apply a regulatory approach harmonized throughout the EU. And uh, this is what you see now on the slide. It's a long title for a regulation which was adopted in 2019. And it focuses on the trans fat uh, of industrial production. So mostly the partially hydrogenated vegetable oils which contain trans fat. And with this uh, legislation, a legal limit of those industrial produced trans fats of two grams per hundred gram of fat in a food, which is intended either to the final consumer or retail was set. Why two grams? We had experience in the EU uh, being pioneered by Denmark, who had introduced uh, years ago a legal limit on industrial produced trans fat, choosing the two gram limit. And when we evaluated this level, we found that uh, the European population with its fat intake would, with such a limit, be still within recommended intake levels even uh, if all foods would be consumed would be just at that level. So we found that this would be a level which would be, so to say, safe. On the other hand, there were experience that this level is also practically achievable because it had been applied already in Denmark. And then a number of other EU member states had followed suit with similar national legislation. Um, there is an addition to this legislation so as you may have seen, this limit applies to all products which the final consumers gets and also to retail, meaning, for example, the food sold to restaurants who use then the oil for frying or for other processing. However, there is an, uh, uh, there, it doesn't cover foods which are traded business to business. So there, these two uh, gram limit could be exceeded. However, there is an obligation in case a product is above that limit to provide information on the amount of industrial trans fat in the food. And therefore also here, it is clear that enforcement authorities can easily enforce throughout the chain and can check also whether then with the with the transparency towards a step up and down in the food chain, whether the final product would meet the 2% the legal limit. We relied on established definitions and it is actually from this year on, from April, that this legal limit applies. 
the transition period was chosen with two years in order to allow particularly for small and medium uh, sized enterprises to adapt their products. Next slide, please. I want to share some of the factors which we found were really influencing the success, which were the supporting factors. And there we, we found that particularly the risk assessors, there was very clear evidence on the health impact of trans fat. So there was no discussion uh, on that. And in Europe, it is the European Food Safety Authority who had given very clear opinions on that. And also WHO had provided very clear guidance on the link with health. As I had said, we had a long experience with similar legal measures and also with voluntary initiatives in the different member states. So we were not starting from scratch, but we could build on what had been achieved before. Overall, we found that after all the experience, major industry associations, health NGOs, consumer organizations all supported us and also the, the, the legislation, the draft legislation. We found that when we did a comprehensive impact assessment, looking on all kinds of impacts possible, uh, social, environmental, economic, that the advantages uh, provided by these legal measures were just very, very clear and convincing. Then also because we had the experience of a different, differing approach in different member states. It was making it difficult to trade food products and to have a level playing field. So having an EU approach was seen as really, and the functioning of the internal market, a big advantage to an EU harmonized approach. We saw that globally, there was a lot of uh, impetus moving away from those industrial trans fats. So that also provided an additional push. And then last but not least, there was advocacy pressure in media, which also supported the adoption. Next slide, please. Talking about successes, challenges we had also, of course. So here particularly, it was the small and medium sized industries, also smaller businesses in retail. They were concerned that uh, these legal limit, if they would be the ones responsible for meeting those, while not being as a very small player uh, in the position to influence too much their suppliers, there were some concerns. So that so those discussions really we had to deal with certain issues and certain concerns. Um, we I think uh, overcome that by this additional inclusion of including the retail sectors, meaning the small. Uh, the small restaurants, also the bakery shops and so on, the 2% legal limit would apply to the products which were sold for them. So that uh, was taking away some of the responsibility which they found was heavy on them. Then the reformulation costs and some lack of technical expertise, particularly from the small businesses. In our impact assessment, we had conducted interviews with the sector. And what we had found is by giving a transition period of the two years, allowed them to test new formulations, look for technical solutions and phase in the cost over this period. So the transition period was really the, the instrument to overcome that challenge. And then the final one, because it's a legal limit on industrial trans fat versus in certain foods, there is a mix between the natural ones from ruminants and from industrial sources. For enforcement, we, we needed a, a methodology, a harmonized methodology for assessment and for calculation, which would ensure that the legal limit would be uh, applied and enforced the same across the EU. And there we could draw on our in-house uh, research service, the Joint Research Center, who had developed in close cooperation with member states, competent authorities, um, a way of assess assessing and calculating um, the, the content to have a harmonized enforcement. The next slide, please. And this is uh, just to show you in the impact assessment and all these documents you can find if you search uh, on, on the internet, on the commission webpage, 
we had compared different uh, possibilities. So we went for limiting industrial transfer, either by voluntary meals or legally binding. Then we looked on having um, labeling and labeling option of the transfer uh, content. And then also we looked on partially hydrogenated oils, prohibiting them with a legal measure or having voluntary measures to limit partially hydrogenated oils and also combinations. And looking on all those, the impact assessment was very clear on public health, uh, uh, social differences, internal market, but also cost and efficacy. The, the legislative measures were clearly outperforming all other options. And here uh, in the EU, we found there was even a slight advantage to limit the industrial transfer content over prohibition of partially hydrogenated oils. So all of that uh, led to finally the adoption of the legislation. And as you have seen, uh, April, uh, it came into force. So we will in the coming years, of course, uh, evaluate and look on the, on the impact but it has been uh, just this year come into, into reality, this legal limit. And I hope I kept my time and maybe even caught up a little bit. That's the end of my... Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we are um, we have about 10 minutes only of time uh, for questions. And so uh, fortunately, I see that many of the questions that have been posed in Q&A have been uh, responded to. So what we may do is just be able to go back uh, to uh, panelists briefly uh, for uh, a little bit of a, a response to a question which I believe the WHO sh shared with you beforehand. Um, which is what would you have done differently? And um, I think I will go to uh, Dr. Abriata first. If you can all come onto the screen, if at all possible, so that we can see all of the speakers who've joined today. Um, I would like to ask all of you, what would you have done differently? So what would you learn for the future? One minute only, please. But Dr. Abriata, I will start with you. And perhaps if you could summarize uh, one or two of the points that um, you weren't able to cover in the earlier intervention as well. That would be fantastic. Um, I'll be able to give you just a, a three minutes, Dr. Abriata. Can we come to you? I'm supposed to. Oh, no. Yeah, can, Graciela, I... can you, would you like to speak at this point? And it would be wonderful to hear from you just uh, three minute points on what would you do differently? Uh, yeah, differently means it's a it's a very tough problem. See the way the way you need to see basically the thing is. Uh, land, sorry, land. sorry. Excuse me, Dr. Prasad. Just wait two seconds. Earlier, I had to cut off Argentina um, during their intervention, so I'm going to go first to Argentina. Um, oh. If you don't mind, do stay on screen though. Uh, can I just check, Dr. Abriata? Are you still there? Hola, sí, ¿qué Hello. tal? Nuevamente. Perdón, disculpen que tuve un llamado. No sé si me habías preguntado algo. No escuché la pregunta. So, um, earlier I had to cut you off because of just the time. Um, so, coming back to you for any key message that you'd like to share. And then the question that we're going to pose to all of the panelists is what would you have done differently? Um, what have you learned that you would do differently next time? Please go ahead. En ese sentido, eh, nosotros reivindicamos la, la ley de reducción de consumo de, de sodio. Fue una de las primeras en nuestro país en relación a los factores de riesgo, al igual que con tabaco, con lo cual uno va aprendiendo. No es fácil, sabemos que las... Eh, los consensos voluntarios, este, los agreements, son necesarios, pero la ley es la que nos marca el rumbo. Es necesaria la presencia del Estado, eh, fijando los valores eh, máximos, eh, definiendo nuevas metas para seguir continuando y avanzando en esta reducción de los, del contenido de sodio en los alimentos, con lo cual es muy importante el marco regulatorio 
como así también es muy importante la fiscalización ¿no? que se realice de eh, que se estén cumpliendo estas metas en el, en el contenido de los productos alimentarios. Entonces, eh, eso es fundamental, es fundamental también las mesas de trabajo en las que convergen justamente el Estado interministerial, por ejemplo en la Argentina, Ministerio de Salud, Ministerio de Agronomía, Ministerio de Producción, así como también el, la interacción con la industria. Es importante, como dijeron ya otros oradores, nosotros sabemos desde la cartera sanitaria la importancia en, en, en relación a los límites máximos de consumo de sodio, pero también hay que entender a, quienes, eh, a, la, a la industria productora de alimentos que algunos eh, contenidos son fundamentales para el, los procesos de elaboración de, los, de, de estos alimentos. Por ejemplo, para los quesos duros, eh, es parte del proceso eh, de la elaboración de estos quesos el, el contenido de, de sal, con lo cual muchas veces eh, es necesario, se requieren más tiempos de adaptación y, y de reformulación de estos contenidos. Así que eh, creo que eso es básicamente mi mensaje. Por otro lado, entonces, como decíamos, eh, la ley, eh, la definición de los límites máximos, la fiscalización por parte de eh, los controles de bromatología y de los departamentos de seguridad alimentaria, contemplar las necesidades de la industria y también es fundamental eh, la vigilancia epidemiológica para poder evaluar el impacto de estas políticas en la población en general. Gracias. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was a great uh, collaborative end uh, to our intervention. Victoria, could I come to you? What would you do differently? Um, I think uh, one of the things we would do differently in the UK would be to ensure that there were a suite of measures in place at one time. Um, with experiences in some other countries, that seems to have been more effective than a single measure on its own. Um, and certainly, as my presentation showed, we have not seen as much change through the sugar reduction program um, uh, as we would have liked. And I think possibly if there had been other measures in place, we would have seen greater change. Do you think that's something you'll build in as you move forward? Uh, yes, there are a whole suite of other measures which are currently in train, so restrictions around advertising and marketing, around promotions, um, the intention to um, introduce out of home, uh, so calorie labelling um, in the out of home sector. And so it's quite possible that all of these will lead to greater formulation and reformulation of products. Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Nilsson, can I come to you in Brazil? Um, as you think about the work that, that you've done on both sodium and trans fats, is there something that you think, ah, I would like to learn more about, I would like to do differently looking forward? Yes, yeah, so I think that uh, there was a huge learning process along the way in this adaptation, but uh, as is for the UK, I think that if we had uh, an opportunity to link all these strategies as measures together at the same time, it would be more impactful and uh, actually link that to our dietary guidelines that, because they came along uh, the way. So it was very important to link what we think about food environments and how to address that to, to improve uh, healthy diets and actually, and to discourage the consumption of ultra processed food. So we have that all this suite together uh, at that time, including fiscal and regulatory measures. I think that we would have achieved more impacts and that's what we look for, uh, towards in the future. What stopped you from having this suite all together in the first place? I think it was a learning process also, but uh, we had to gather information along the way. So at, at this point, we, I think we have more studies and more research on the field. We have more impact assessments. So that also helps us to build this advocacy case and ask you to improve decision making uh, at this moment. At, that, uh, at the beginning, we didn't have it. And I think that the more countries that are engaged and especially the support by WHO, PAHO, UNICEF uh, and other entities is very important for us to move forward. And And of course, and I think it's very important to uh, increase the participation of consumer organizations because that kind of external advocacy is very important for us actually to uh, press governments to uh, actually to move forward and to move towards effect, more effective uh, policies. Great call to action. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Prasad, can I come to you? What would you have done differently um, as you created your intervention uh, back in February already? One minute. 
Yeah, I think it's very, very tough to tell that what we can do differently because it's a very, very tough job to really do. We cannot do overnight. So it's impossible because when the, the whole country is such a big country, so many what you call refineries, so many people uh, what you call them producing. So in a different manner, I think it's very tough. Whatever we really employed, we involved regulators, industry, consumers, research organizations, and also experts. And we had several brainstorming sessions. We, we really convinced the industry that there is a need to really reduce the trans time. So I think uh, when, when, unless you really, because at that time, what, what people, what the industry was telling that we can't sell our products. So see, basically the thing is you need to convince the industry. So I think more aggressively, one has to really convince the industry. Unless you convince the industry, I think we cannot really bring this sort of reforms. And also industry requires the alternate technology. Suddenly when we say that reduce the trans fat, they can't really make anything. So basically we need to really put the, the alternate technology, different technological options in place. And then we need to really what you call, no? uh, influence the industry. I think more aggressively, if, you, if you're given me next opportunity, I think we'll, we'll really gear up with the technological options very appropriately and approach the industry and, and convince the, what you call, uh, the consumers and uh, bring the regulation. I think that's what I feel. Very good. And Stephanie, perhaps could you respond to that? How do you create that collaborative conversation with industry? Uh... We have been in close contact with industry via different fora since many years in the EU. So there have been calls on industry to reformulate products to improve the nutritional value since many, many years. So there is, I would say, an, an established uh, link and process on that. And uh, in relation to the, the trans fat uh, now policy, I think one can say there was quite a, we, we took quite a long time going from national measures, voluntary commitments. Then I didn't go into detail. There was a study launched, a comprehensive impact assessment before we came to the conclusion to do the legal limit as we did. So on the one hand side, one may criticize that this long process is long. On the other hand, I think in the end, the adoption seemed to be not so difficult because through the process and all the talking and all the, the initiatives, there was consensus reached. So uh, what would I do differently? It took long, but I think we came to a good result. And finally, the re achieving the result wasn't so difficult anymore in the end because we had all these discussions, the evidence, the studies to back up what we were doing. This is wonderful. I want to thank all of you for cramming so much insight and brilliance into a, such a short space of time. We could have gone on for much, much longer. And um, I, all of us support you in the fantastic work that you're doing and the leadership that you're showing. Uh, to close the session, I'd love to hand over to Mr. Joe Jewell uh, from UNICEF. Joe, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Helena, and thank you very much to all the speakers for a, a really brilliant um, overview of the action that you've been taking. Um, we have two minutes left, so it's going to be very short. But you know, today's session focused on food product reformulation, which is you know increasingly a relevant challenge around the world, including uh, low middle income countries where they are more widely available and promoted. And we know that unfortunately, often these products um, are of worse nutritional quality in some of the low middle income countries, which really underlines the effort. Um, that is needed globally. Um, you know, the, the presentation is really talking about a journey that the countries have been on um, and the steps that they're taking often started relatively small and piecemeal, but over time have built up. Um, and indeed, some countries have recognized the need to move towards legislative approaches to have a greater impact or to make more stringent uh, criteria so that the impact on public health is, is better. But I think one of the key themes coming through today is that uh, a more holistic approach is needed, that we need this suite of policies that Victoria mentioned in order to have the greatest impact. So reformulation is clearly part of the solution, but we also need the levies, the taxes, the front of pack nutrition labeling, the marketing restrictions portion size effort, bans on price promotions. So um, all of these are going to be needed if we're going to have uh, the impact on, on public health nutrition. I will use 10 seconds to pitch for the 
forthcoming webinars. So tomorrow we have one on fiscal measures and on Thursday there's one on front pack nutrition labeling and uh, marketing. So we are actually recognizing that this suite of policy is needed. So to, do join us. Thank you to everyone again for the time. We recognize how important it is on behalf of UNICEF and WHO. We really recognize the support of countries in our efforts to make uh, nutrition for growth the success and you know build on commitments towards healthier diets around the world. Thanks so much uh, from all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.